freeze frame. How important is that? We think it's very important. Now, it's data that is stored for the first failed test that sets the code and illuminates the mill. Freeze frame data is not updated, it's not refreshed, if the test fails a second time. So your freeze frame, freeze frame data is from the first time the PCM saw a fault and set the code. Fuel trim and misfire codes are going to be overwriting the freeze frame. They can overwrite the existing freeze frame data unless the data that's in the freeze frame is for fuel trim or misfire. So the fuel trim and misfire can overwrite everything but itself. It's important to know when this fault was stored. That's what you're trying to accomplish by taking a minute to look at the freeze frame. Fuel trim and misfire DTCs overwrite freeze frame record, record uh, unless a fuel trim or misfire DTC is already stored. So yeah, we're going to overwrite a component code. We're going to overwrite a um, bad TPS, TPS too high, with a fuel trim or a misfire code. Now, fuel and misfire DTCs have priorities. Other DTCs cannot overwrite them. Fuel and misfire DTCs have priority. Other codes cannot overwrite them, but they can overwrite other DTCs. They will not run after failure until engine operating conditions are approximately the same. So it's not going to run a second time of a two trip. It's not going to run and check on something unless the similar conditions in the freeze frame have been met. Fuel and misfire DTCs have this priority. Now, that means they're king of the hill. They can overwrite. They can't be overwritten. This is important because you're going to want to know what problem the freeze frame is attached to. When we look inside the freeze frame, we're going to see engine load, engine RPM, short and long-term fuel trims. We're going to see vehicle speed, coolant temperature sensor uh, signal, inlet manifold pressure, open or closed loop status, fuel pressure if available, and the DTC, the J2012 DTC. Now here we've blown it up so you can read it. Engine loads in percentile, the RPMs in RPM. Short and long term are in percentiles, vehicle speed, miles per hour. The coolant temp is in degrees Fahrenheit. Intake manifold pressure is going to be your MAF or your MAP input signal. Open or closed loop status is going to tell you it's open or closed. Fuel pressure, if available, then of course the J2012 code to go along with that. The calculated engine load. This is airflow divided by the peak airflow. Peak airflow may be adjusted for altitude via, you know, atmospheric pressure, the barometric pressure means. Now, we have noted that vacuum leaks can really have a dramatic effect on this value. In fact, we could sit around and tell you a whole bunch of war stories about vacuum leaks and how they can really mask other problems. So when you're trying to deal with calculated engine load, you're trying to use that PID and you have a vacuum leak, you're just wasting your time. These values tell you which fuel cell the vehicle was operating in at the time the fault was set. Which fuel cell? We'll talk a little more about fuel cells in a little while. Manifold pressure or absolute manifold pressure sensor measures and reports vacuum. It's, it, it's really load, but we're going to refer to it as vacuum. It's used to calculate engine load, timing advance, and remember anything that affects timing affects fuel, and so it's going to contribute to fuel trim. These values tell you if the engine was warmed up and in closed loop. Of course, the coolant temperature sensor, you know, was the fault set when the engine was cold and we were in open loop, or was it in warmed up and in closed loop? Now, Engine coolant temperature sensor startup performance depends heavily on the sensor. It must be accurate. It supplies ambient temperature at startup. 
injector pulse width is heavily dependent on this sensor, causing engines to run rich at cold startup, automatic choke. And that's what we need. We need that richness at cold startup, or we need that choke. Fuel enrichment is usually tapered off somewhere around 150 degrees Fahrenheit and usually done by 160 degrees Fahrenheit. You know what we're saying here, the startup performance, start-up performance, you know, up to 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the ECT is just another input. It's not as heavily dependent upon. So this tells you which DTC the freeze frame is attached to in that J2012, and you want to use the freeze frame to determine when the fault was set to help you identify conditions where the monitor will run again. Many people say that they can't get monitors to run. I would say, do you have a freeze frame? Yeah. Well, that's when a fault was set, so apparently a monitor will run if you repeat these freeze frame similar conditions. So protect that freeze frame. It's attached to the DTC. If you clear the code, you're going to get rid or erase the freeze frame. If vehicle power is lost, the freeze frame is erased, meaning that code will be gone too. But if you work with the door open, the key on, and the hood up, and the hood light on, the trunk light on, radio playing, and then you let this battery go dead because you went off to lunch or home, you can actually erase the freeze frame in the code, and then you kind of just don't know exactly what's going to go on. Drive that freeze frame. The freeze frame data allows you to duplicate the same driving conditions when the fault was set. That's right. We just said two slides ago that we know the monitor will run under these conditions. How? It ran and set a fault. It's right in front of us. So if we make a repair and we drive the vehicle under the similar conditions, we're going to have the monitor run. The monitor ran and failed under these conditions? you should be able to duplicate it. When a fault's detected on the first trip of a two-trip monitor, the PCM is going to store pending code. Pending DTCs, um, they may not be the best thing in the world, but they help point to different problems. If a fault's detected for a second trip, a consecutive second trip, the PCM will mature that pending DTC into a hard DTC. So here we go. Check for pending codes. You know, here's we're talking about 2005 forward vehicles. You can have no diagnostic trouble codes, but you can have pending codes. Now, this, of course, applies to all the way back to all OBD2 vehicles, but it's very prevalent in 2005 forward vehicles that you cannot have any diagnostic trouble codes, but you can certainly have a pending code. And this pending code is telling us that the TPS signal does not match operating conditions. And the module, of course, it came from the PCM. So this P0121 isn't a hard code. It's a pending code. The computer saw something wrong with the TPS. Uh, it detected a fault, and it happened at least once. Now, it may or may not ever repeat itself. So you're going to add pending codes to the picture of the problem to help you diagnose this vehicle. It indicates another circuit or another component that requires being checked out or being tested certainly may help to avoid a comeback as being tested. Then we need measured value. And you can see that if we look on some of our measured values, they're in red. We're going to explain that later. So these are the test results, the results of the last time the monitored run. These are the measured value. And then we have a minimum value in this column here. If there's a minimum value, it's going to be placed here. Then we'll have a maximum value. And if, if there is a maximum value, it's going to be placed here. So what do we mean by if there's a minimum, if there's a maximum? As you can see on the screen, on the first one, we have a minimum but no maximum. On the second one, we have a minimum but no maximum. When we go down to the fifth one, we have no minimum but a maximum. They usually don't have both. They either have one or the other. The unit of measurement is in the last column, and it's placed here. Now, it can be voltage. It can be inches of water. It can be a percentile. Sometimes it's said to be unitless. That means it's just a count, a count used to determine a test result. These pass or these pass or fail statuses are very important, meaning did that part of the monitor run? And then if it did, did it pass 
or did it fail? Now in our scan tool here, a pass status has no coloring around the test value. A fail status has that red. Yours may say at the, at the bottom of the screen or at the side of the screen say test pass, test failed. Your scan tool is going to identify the status of the test, whether it passed or failed, in its own way. Now, the pass and the fail status on our scan tool appears red. It doesn't mean it's going to appear red on your scan tool. You'll have to read the screen. So mode 6 uh, misfire information is something that we usually use when we first get involved in mode 6 because GM had their misfire counters in test mode 1 in PIDs. We got very used to using them. And Chrysler had some of their vehicles there also. Well Ford put their misfire uh, test information in mode 6. So I think this is where we most of us cut our teeth on mode 6 going into mode 6 Ford looking at misfire counters or misfire information so we could determine which cylinder was misfiring. Now within two or three minutes of sitting in the front seat of a vehicle pushing buttons on a scan tool you should have a pretty good picture of what the PCM anything it saw and why it's at the fault. By looking at everything that you can gather you're going to have a direction in which to take your diagnostics. What to get out of that seat, put that scan tool down, and what to go test. So whether the mill is illuminated or not you certainly want to look for DTCs, pending DTCs, freeze frame, history records if that vehicle has them, warm-up cycles, trip counters, and mode 6 information. Now there are nine OBD2 test modes and we're asking you to go look at these seven to help you with your diagnostics.